at Holly Rowe, and I think he got his point across. But, Sam, we are down there on the field, and yeah. I can honestly say it didn't feel like Jalen Hurts had that big of a night as he did. That's a thing. I, That's I was thing. sitting down there, and then I look at the stat sheet at the end of the day as we're sitting in uh, the press conference room afterwards, and I'm like, this guy had 530 yards? Like, when? Yeah, I, didn't yeah, even, they, I didn't even notice. Yeah. He's sitting there. He's touching the ball at all times, and I think one thing Jalen Hurts has got to realize is he's got a, a whole ensemble around him oh, yeah. that can really make plays. So I think he needs to utilize those in the future. I 100% agree with that. I think the one thing about Jalen that I did really enjoy about the game, I was in the press box, so I got the good, nice bird eye view. The air conditioning. The air conditioning. (laughs) Must be nice. (laughs) Right. But, um, you know, everyone was talking about how he didn't have the same physicality as Baker or Kyler. And I think that going into this game, that's kind of what he proved is, hey, I can run the ball too, which is great. But there's been so many question marks when it comes to his passing game. This first game didn't answer any of those questions for me. Yeah. I wanted to see, I mean, he had a good 56-yarder uh, pass to Rambo, but other than that, there, were, there wasn't those big, beautiful Kyler or Baker throws, and that's what I was looking forward to. And to touch on the defense, I think the defense is better than what it was, and I think that's always a good thing to say when we're talking about Sooner defense. However, yeah. again, it's, I feel like their momentum doesn't carry. When they start off the game, it's quick. They're off the line. You can see those hips turning and breaking out. But once you hit that third quarter, you can see that they're tired. And I think that that's going to be the next step is pushing through kind of the halftime, like, okay, we're down, let's get back up type of a thing. I think the Sooners need to learn how to push through and carry through. Because like you said, that's what those big dynasty teams do. They play football from the very start to the very end, and that's what I want to see out of OU. Yeah, an an interesting start, no doubt. I think a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on it. Some steps in the right direction, Mm -hmm. some things to improve on. But let's shift our attention to South Dakota. You know, they obviously it's South Dakota, but I don't think this team is looking over this challenge in any way. Let's take a look at what Lincoln Riley and some of the players have to say about the matchup. South Dakota made a really strong impression on me, and uh, you know, looking ahead, knowing we're going to play those guys, you know, you got a team that's certainly not going to come in here intimidated and is and uh, and is going to be a good football team. We're going to treat every game the same. Um, we'll let y'all talk about the rat poison of it. Um, we're, we're going to focus on what we need to focus on, and we're going, to, you know, try and get better this week. It's exciting because you understand there's going to be more opportunities. It's not just for a specific specific person or a player, um, but just understand you got to be ready and be ready for that moment and take advantage of it. I'm looking for us to play consistent, um, consistently dominant. Well, the, the, the message is the goal doesn't change. Yeah. You know, you don't uh, miss a sales goal at, at Apple and say let's let's lower our standard. You know, let's let's. New York Yankees has finished third in our division. It'll be okay because we, we had a tough stretch in May. Like that doesn't that you don't do that. Mm-hmm. Now it doesn't mean you're going to get it done. It's all talk. I mean, I can say and I can talk tough and all those things. We got to go do it. And, and, and obviously, it starts in practice. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very confident in, in how we practice. Plan and the standard we set out for ourselves. And that's the most important and, and most motivating factor. Ever. And if we want to be the team that, that we think we have a chance to be, then. You know, regardless of who we're playing, we have to take steps, and we got to be ready to play each and every time we hit the field. You know, we're not we're not baseball. You know, we don't get 50 something games. We're not basketball. We don't get 40 something games. I mean, we only get a couple of these, and so we're going to make the most of every one we get. Will you point? All right, guys. Good to hear from Lincoln Riley and some of the players about South Dakota, a team that obviously I can think we can all say we didn't know a ton about going into this week, but we've done our research and stuff, just like the team has. They they know that South Dakota, even though they're an FCS opponent. They're going to take them as seriously as all the other weeks, Sule. I mean, is that the right, right mentality to have right now, or should they be a little more focused really on what's to come? Oh, I mean, absolutely. Like, you can't you can't walk over anybody. In this, in, like, in college football, we've seen Appalachian States get victories when people overlook them. So we can't have that happening th- this week. But what I think something that Shiloh kind of pointed out uh, when we were talking about Houston, like, this defense has a lot to improve on, and I think they did improve uh, over the last – in this last week. But one of the reasons why we are so tired is because we don't have that much depth on defense. And mm-hmm. it's been a problem for this team for a really long time. And what I think games like this allow you to do is it allows you, because of, like, on, and just because of the nature of the game, South Dakota is a less talented team than we are going to play all year. And like, that's not a knock on South Dakota, that's just how the program is. Mm-hmm. And because they are an FCS opponent, we can play players that aren't normally going to get run against 
uh, Houston's or the Big 12 competition just to see who can step up, who's really ready to take that next step that can help us defensively with depth. I mean, we had a good game defensively against Houston. Uh, three sacks, eight tackles for loss. We only had eight, 11 sacks all year last year. So to see the defense improve like that is good. But we have to see, like, who wants, like, like you said, like, we're going to get into some grind sessions. Like, when we play Oklahoma State, when we play Texas, like, there is going to be a lot of rotation on that defense to keep guys fresh. Who can be those guys that can step up? That's what I think you can answer a little bit, at least, against South Dakota. Yeah, and I agree. I, earlier I said that the defense hadn't had some good points, but don't get me wrong. They've had a, a what seems like a league's worth of improvement. Yeah. Like, we, we've got guys Christian's on... softening up a little bit. Right. Yeah. It was hard take at the start. Listen, I, I realized it seemed like I was being kind of condescending, and I wasn't giving them as much props as they deserve. Yeah. Ronnie Perkins, we talked about it, has looked like an animal. Kenneth yeah. Murray is playing as, as good as football as he's played. Oh, yeah. So, there, there's definitely some great points on this defense, but you, you really hit the nail on the head. They don't really have much depth. You saw uh, second string guys, the guys that uh, aren't starters but do play and get rotation reps, mm -hmm. uh, not really make the plays that are uh, expected of the starters. So I really am looking forward to uh, seeing them try and elevate their game a little bit. Because as we talked about yesterday on OU Nightly, this is a tune-up game. So I mean, I don't want to take South Dakota lightly, don't get me wrong, but uh, I mean, we should steamroll them. There's a 41 and a half uh, point spread in our favor. and I, that the over? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to go with the over <laughs> on that one. So, I mean, I, I'm just looking for a lot of our guys to get good film, uh, really improve their game, and, like, mino raise, and uh, just take baby steps from last game. Keep improving on what we've seen. I think games uh, like South Dakota really test the guy's mental ability. This yeah. is when, as we said, there's not a lot of depth, but there is a lot of young guys on the defense. The majority of the recruiting class were defensive players because they're trying to reach that depth. This is the type of game where you really get to test the guys on whether or not mentally they can handle that. If they're going to go in, if they're going to take it seriously. And I mean, the same thing, I guess, with the bigger games too, if they can handle that kind of pressure. But when it's so lax, it's real easy to kind of forget all the things that you've trained and all the things that you focused on and kind of go revert into like, I'm just playing some football. And I think that that's really going to be the test tonight whenever they play. Yeah. yeah, and to that point, I mean, last week, seven penalties, 94 yards. Yeah. It's unacceptable, and that's the kind of thing you got to work on going into these kind of weeks because mm -hmm. it's easy, it would be very easy to get penalties like that, false mm -hmm. starts, offsides, right. when you're not 100% there mentally. And I think that like, if you're going to be a player that you want to prove something to Alex Grinch, like I've talked about it before, like he's not the kind of guy that is going to let you just sit there and rest on your laurels. No. Yeah. Like he's going to want you to prove yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but on the flip side of that, one thing I did notice this week uh, against Houston that has been a problem throughout the – was a problem throughout the Mike Stoops era, of not a lot of looking over to the sideline, not a lot of confusion on what the coverage was. Everyone seemed to be – like they would look to Kenneth Murray every once in a while for calls or maybe a, a couple changes in the play, but like – they did there was no panicked what's okay. going on like everyone kind of seemed to be on the same page which I think this is another one of those weeks where you can continue to like get in the books prove that you know what you're doing and I think it like if we can continue to improve like that is huge if we can get everybody on the same page it'd be huge for the team yeah yeah we'll see how we'll see how tonight pans out just a little less than 10 hours until the Sooners host the South Dakota Coyotes here at Gaylord Memorial Stadium but that's it for now. We're going to come back with some more Sooners talk. We've got plenty for you guys. After the break, we're going to talk about some offensive weapons that kind of went under the spotlight a little bit but deserves their own attention. Stay with us. football season, it looked like the Sooners would have a lot to make up for. Oklahoma lost Heisman winner Kyler Murray, Marquise Hollywood Brown, four out of five of the big men on the award-winning O-line, and don't forget the overhaul on the defensive side of the ball. But many didn't account for the guys on the come-up who had been waiting for their moment. Guys like Jeremiah Hall, Charleston Rambo, Marcus Stripling, and Jaden Hazelwood all rose to the occasion in the first game of the season. Now let's start with the man who got the game going, Jeremiah Hall. The redshirt sophomore had a huge night, scoring the first touchdown of the season for the Sooners and the first touchdown of his career. A play good enough to get the fullback a headbutt from coach Shane Beamer on the sideline, who then had to get stitches. That was definitely a first for me. There were so many people hitting my head, and 
And um, me and Beamer normally meet up after every drive. And uh, for like five minutes, Beamer went missing. So he came back with a gash on his head. I said, what happened, coach? He was like, you. Then there was wide receiver Charleston Rambo, who led the team for 105 yards and a touchdown against Houston, starting right where he left off last season. Now, he may not be the fan favorite like Hollywood yet, but Rambo definitely has the speed and athleticism needed for the job. He's been working hard. And one of the question marks is the receiver group with losing Marquise and he specifically playing his positions for him to step up and have a big game like he did first game was really good. And let's not forget the new Wave 19 crew. True freshman Marcus Stripling and Jaden Hazelwood proved themselves in their first starts as Sooners. Stripling had a nice tackle in the second half, and Hazelwood caught two passes for nearly 50 yards. Jaden did a nice job. You know, you, you always kind of look for the, the true freshman of what's the look in their eye. You know, most of our guys had a great look in our eye, and he was no different. He was ready. Riley and Grinch played a wide rotation of 26 guys last week, but finding the right man for the job takes more than one game. However, Hall, Rambo, Stripling, and Hazelwood all made a case for themselves to permanently see their name on the depth chart. We'll see who comes up big tonight at 6 as Oklahoma takes on South Dakota right here in the Palace on the Prairie. Back to you, Sam. Thanks, Meredith. Appreciate that, guys. We're back here. Just outside Gaylord Memorial Stadium, about 10 hours until the Sooners play the South Dakota Coyotes. It's a beautiful day, honestly. It's going to be a fun time, but let's go ahead and talk about the offensive side of the ball, which we, we touched on a little bit earlier. Jalen Hurts found 10 different receivers the other day. Several different players had some good rushing days as well. They ran the ball well. The offensive line was solid, but as a result, a lot of those players have kind of gone under the radar. So, Sule, give me a couple players that really deserve a little bit more attention after their performances. Yeah, I mean, obviously with an offense as explosive as ours, you're going to get a lot of people getting a lot of run, and especially in week one, we're trying to see who's good. Uh, a guy that surprisingly is going under the radar for me, CeeDee Lamb, uh, had two ca two catches for 46 yards, uh, a pretty underwhelming guy day for our uh, wide receiver one. Like, he's the kind of guy, like, he's the a leader in this team, and I expect more out of him, and I, ex I think Sooner Nation expects more out of him in the coming weeks. But I mean, he's returning punts now and he looked dangerous. He had a 27 yard return at one point. He's going to be a star. Like while he did not have a star kind of game, he's going to be a star. Another kind of guy that I think uh, people are only fixating on the one bad thing he did, Ramondre Stevenson. He fumbled on his first carry of the game. It wasn't entirely his fault. He never really had, uh, never really had the handoff with Galen or with Tanner at that point, I'm sorry. Uh, but he came back, Lincoln Riley stuck with him despite the fumble. Six carries, 46 yards, or 41 yards, I'm sorry. He had a 21 yard touchdown, a, a run of 25 yards at one point. He got good run in this game. And with TJ Pledger down now with surgery, he's going to get a lot of time in this offense. Like I said, especially in games like this against South Dakota, you're gonna see guys like that who maybe aren't the first or even second string guy. Like obviously the running back room is a Sermon Brooks room right now. Mm -hmm. But Stevenson is a guy, he's a JUCO transfer, can make a name for himself if he can do well, especially in an offense as potent as Lincoln Riley's. We need depth like that, and, and they are going to need guys that can run the ball consistently, in, especially if somebody gets hurt. It's yeah. kind of crazy to say, right, that CD is going under the radar right now. Yeah. <laughs> that was bold. I was, was like, I, I mean, but like, think about it. None of the coverage, none of the coverage, I mean, the, other than the one catch, where right. he's as wide open as he's ever gonna be ever again, he's like he he really didn't do anything. He, had like, one he didn't good get a return. lot of consistent yeah. separation, yeah. and some of that might be on Jalen for not looking for him as much. Some of it might be on him for not getting away from the defensive backs. What I'm saying is, C.D. Lamb is not being talked about, and I think that's gonna change pretty soon. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. a benefactor of what I was saying earlier. Jalen having as big of a night really didn't help the rest of the crew yeah. Yeah. have as good of a night. All the attention was on him. Yeah, that. that's what I'm saying. So I I think. He needs to take advantage of the uh, crew of people he's got oh, yeah. and really oh, yeah. really let them thrive. And it, I think the, this past week really hurt CD's chances at a Bolitnikoff award at the end of the season. So it's unfortunate, but, I mean, maybe he'll get more touches this week. And it's still week one. It's still week one. He's got, a lot, it, of, he's it, got a lot of time. You're right. You're right. It is, a, it is pretty early. It is pretty early. We got South Dakota tonight. He, sure, might, yeah, he yeah. might go for 15 and 200. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? But that's part of the reason I think my uh, offense, one of my offensive players uh, didn't get as much spotlight as he could have. My guy, Trey Sermon. Trey Sermon in the offseason yeah. talked about how he had lost a few pounds and really felt like he was more agile, and I feel like we saw that in complete 
dominant fashion. He was hurdling guys, making everyone miss. Oh, yeah. Every single time he touched the ball, the first guy came up to tackle him, missed. Every <laughs> single time. It was amazing. I was like, wow, this guy looks like Marshawn Lynch out there. Like, yeah. it's, gonna be, it's gonna be scary in a few years to watch him play, hopefully on Sundays. And in turn, I think the guy that's blocking for him, Jeremiah Hall, also had a great afternoon. He tied the team in leading receptions. He had three catches for 27 yards. Yeah. Oh, Not and a scoring, too. And a touchdown, yeah. He scored the first touchdown of the season for the Sooners. So I think he's going to really walk into a Dimitri Flowers kind of role as an H-back that's going to see a lot of touches, see the field a lot of the times, and really be asked to make uh, some impact plays in this Lincoln Riley offense. Off of your Trace uh, Sermon a um, little bit, but uh, he had three back-to-back 10-plus -back yards rushing. Yeah. I think that you know, we're constantly looking for the next big running back, and I think he might be our guy. Yeah. I, I think that we saw some real flashes of brilliance with him. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I, I really wish uh, this offense wasn't as much of a committee running back style <laughs> as it right. is, because I really could see him going on for 20, 20 yards, 200, or 20 carries, excuse right. me, and 200 yards. But I mean, we run by committee, so that's just how Lincoln Riley that's operates. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, he leads the he leads the country in yards after contact the last two years. Which, yeah. when you think about the talent pool that's coming through, like guys like Jonathan Taylor, Bryce Love, like mm -hmm. the, the last two years, like that's an incredible Feet. statistic to be able to do that and still keep doing it. And Jeremiah Hall might be a uh, early contender for the Low Man Award, fullback oh, of the year. Yeah. If he keeps this up, so uh, yeah. I like that. I like those picks. Yeah. Right. Shiloh, who you got? Well, my guy is, I think, Woke falling a little under the radar as well um, and he has been for a while he hasn't been playing as much uh, but my guy's got to be Charleston Rambo he's played now under Kyler under Baker but he's just now kind of getting that limelight he got a real nice 56 yarder with Jalen and I've had the pleasure of getting to talk to Charleston uh, during summer and spring and he always says I feel like they're sleeping on me and I think that one, that's a great thing to feel like because then you have something to prove. And I mean, we keep saying it. Jalen has a great offense behind him. He has so many tools. And I think that is one reason why guys like CD, guys like Trey Sermon, they're not getting their hand on the ball as much because there are so many people for it to go around to. And I think Charleston Rambo is starting to make his name. Um, my second guy, Grant Calcaterra, man, that guy catches yeah. everything. It is, I mean, it's really amazing because I feel like tight ends are very undervalued, uh, especially in this day and age of football. But when he gets his hand on the ball, one, he's a big guy. People, it normally takes a couple hits for to, to bring him down. And two, he makes catches on slants, in between people, I mean, little quick jabs that you never see coming. And I think that that's what makes him so special. Now, he didn't ha get his hands on the ball very much either. I think he had only two, um, two times that he carried for about 14 yards. But uh, he just, he's got the build. He's got that mentality. I think that he can really go far. And in Big 12 media days, a lot of the coaches were talking about the importance of a tight end, especially with the new revamping of Big 12 defenses. I think that having a great running back in Trey Sermon, having the receiving core that Jalen has. I mean, there's too many names to talk about on the receiving core, in my yeah. opinion. And now also having that tight end, a key lock in. I mean, there are, Jalen is quite literally surrounded with opportunities. And I think that's a really great thing to have. I mean, too many players on the receiving core. There's a reason why I told you guys to pick two players each. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way we we're going to get we through one forever. player. We talk forever. That's the thing. There's, I mean, you guys picked out six players today that could all have big games right out here tonight again. Yeah. So who do you, who do we think steps up? Maybe do you know? Is it is it maybe a mix of a of a Trey Sermon and then Calcaterra who was a little quieter to see mm -hmm. make his impact felt? What do you guys think? I mean, the the players that I think none of none of us mentioned, but um, I expect to have big games tonight. The five star receivers, Hazelwood, uh -huh. Bridges, and Weiss. Yeah, Hazelwood, Hazelwood had a, nice a really good catch, yeah. and no surprise, he was the highest rated of the group uh, to come out of a high school and was the first one to get on the field, make a big impact. I don't think anyone's super surprised by that, but i like to see those guys get some run tonight. Yeah, Hazelwood with a great run after the catch. That's a really important part of being a receiver. It's what you do once you have the ball in your hands. And he looked good once he had the ball in his hands. So I, I think he might have a, a, an improved role 
Um, but I, I really want to see Trey Sermon get 20 carries. I, I really want to see him touch the ball. I want to see him get 175 yards and show that he's really uh, ready to roll his game up to the next level. Going into tonight, I think first and foremost, I want Jalen to get the ball out of his hands more. I don't want to see him running the ball. He proved himself as a running back <laughs> sure. the last week. So I don't want to see that again. I want to see that air raid offense. That's what I want to see in him. I want to see, because when it gets down to those nitty gritty games, when you've got to make it happen, those passes are what's going to do it. So I really want the, the wide receivers to take a step up, whether that be CD, whether that be Rambo. But that's what I want to see. Also, it's more exciting when you see that ball just fly 50 yeah. yards. Yeah. And you, I mean, it's exciting. It really gets everybody riled up and selfishly, that's what I want to see. Yeah, we'll see if Jalen can make some, some steps as a passer again, like I said, still, yeah. still quite a ways to go in that area. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk some more Sooners later on in the show. That's actually going to do it from now uh, for us. On the other side of the break, though, Tevis Hillis and the studio team take over. They're going to give us a little bit of a Clemson, a Clemson Bama talk, and you're not going to want to miss it. Game Day U, I'm your host, Tevis Hillis. Now let's get started with the top five moments of this week. I'm sorry for the technical, there we go. Pacific Northwest for play number five, Jacob Eason to Aaron Fuller, who reels they it in with it one on. hand. Check this catch out from all the angles, a phenomenal grab by the senior wideout. Number four, Missouri at Wyoming. If you come for Sean Chambers, be prepared to get stiff-armed into another dimension. The quarterback springs himself for the 75-yard scamper all the way to the promised land he goes. Wyoming stuns Mizzou 37-31 in Laramie. Quick trip down I-80 for play number three, Nebraska hosting South Alabama. The Husker offense was stagnant for most of the day, but J.D. Spielman provides a much needed spark right here. He'll field the punt, weave his way through coverage, and he's off to the races. Tiptoes down the sideline and 76 yards later, he hits pay dirt as the Big Red hold off the Jaguars 35 to 21. On to number two, Purdue and Nevada. Deadlocked at 31, three seconds on the clock. This is freshman walk-on kicker Brandon Talton Ball game from 56 yards. The Wolfpack pull the upset in dramatic fashion, and Talton earned himself a well-deserved scholarship. Now, play number one won't come as a surprise to anybody. Auburn and Oregon, the legend of Bo Nix is born. Tigers trailing by one in the final seconds, and the true freshman delivers a strike to Seth Williams. Auburn wins 27 to 21, and Nix's throw takes home the honors as our top play of week one. Back to Tevis, Matt, Austin, and Kemper. Guys, take it away. Guys, some interesting plays. So let's get down to it. What did you all think for the top five moments? Hit it, Matt. Come well, on. First of all, my thoughts and prayers go out to any Pac-12 defensive backs <laughs> that have to line up against Darren Fuller this season because, I mean, man. Oh, yikes. Yeah, I'm going to go Bo Nix. Being a true freshman and stepping up in that moment with a big game being in, in prime time, I mean, that's big. I mean, I know he didn't have the best of performance, but, I mean, to step up and win, win your team the game, that's, that's something else. Man, I was looking at that beautiful back shoulder throw by Jacob Eason. That is my guy. He has been killing it in week one. Four touchdowns. <laughs> that easily the most impressive of the week. Blown away. Love what I'm seeing from Jacob Eason. I'm going to go back to the Oregon-Auburn game because we had Cal Day on the show last week, and he was talking about how uh, Oregon was going to come back and, you know, really hit it, really do well. But... You know? They had many opportunities that game to pull through. And they, they didn't. And they didn't, exactly. No. So, I mean, that's their fault. Oregon still can't finish. They just can't. It's been a problem in the past few years. It's still a problem right now. The Ducks cannot finish. <laughs> Say it straight to the TV one more time, I think. <laughs> the I Ducks think, cannot finish. I think it's early on. I think people are falling a little prisoner to the moment. You know, it was, week, it was a week one loss. You know, Oregon can bounce back. Justin Herbert, still a stud. I think I really think Oregon can put the pieces back together and really bounce back this week against Nevada. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's go straight into our big discussion. Top dog in college football, Clemson or Alabama? Kemper? Well, not, not the Kansas Jayhawks? Uh, not the Kansas Jayhawks. Want to know? Come done. on, less is more, baby. <laughs> well, for me, I think it's Clemson. And I think it's Clemson because... 
Trevor Lawrence did not have a very good game in week one. 168 yards and two interceptions, no passing touchdowns, but Clemson still had a huge win. Travis Etienne, huge game. 205 yards and three touchdowns on only 12 carries. What I think that shows is that Clemson's got the ability to win games by a large margin, even without a huge performance from their star quarterback. Bama, I feel like, is really reliant on Tua Tagovailoa right now. You know, Jalen's not there to bail him out like last year in the SEC championship game. But Clemson is such a complete team. I don't really think they need Alabama, or I don't really think they need Trevor Lawrence to put up crazy big Heisman numbers every single week to win. I think they've got enough that they can put it together without him. Awesome. What's your prediction? Um, you know, when you have a race this close and you have two teams that are really good, um, I know Clemson, they did destroy Alabama in the national championship last year, but I don't think Love it's it. fair to, um, to give it to them because in the past, Alabama has dominated for the majority of the time. So I'm going to have to go with Bama. Um, you know, when you have very little information we do with it being so early in the season, you kind of have to go off uh, game one performances. Uh, Alabama, they did get off to a slow start, but I mean, Tua Tagovailoa, he looked healthy. He was out there ready to go. The defense was in sync. They were playing very physical. Um, and I definitely think what, what kind of hurts Clemson in this run is the fact, you mentioned it earlier, Trevor Lawrence not having, you know, the best of performances. He threw two interceptions against, um, against Georgia Tech. And I mean, I know that it came, or one of them came late right before halftime, but this first one you're about to see here, it's kind of, I mean, it was, it was a real quick throw, but I mean, it's just, like I said, when you have so much to go off of, you kind of have to be real nitpicky. And so I think, you know, early up, Alabama still has it. However, if Clemson can win the national championship and repeat as champs this year, then I think it would be fair to give it to, uh, to, give it to Clemson. But as of now, I'm going to have to stick with Alabama. See, I'm with you, Austin. I think the history in Alabama is just so much thicker than Clemson. So why not call them? But I guess respect. Exactly. Okay, Matt, what do you have? Well, the deciding vote falls to me, <laughs> and I'm siding with Kemper. I think Clemson snatched the title of top dog in college football with that blowout win against Alabama. Now, Alabama can reclaim it if they win the national championship again this year, but I don't see that happening, and here's why. Many of the same offensive players that gave Alabama nightmares in that title game are back for Clemson. Trevor Lawrence, T. Higgins, Travis Etienne, and Justin Ross, who's made these incredible circus catches, one of which you'll see in a second. Uh, look, these guys had the Alabama secondary burnt worse than me when I forget to put on sunscreen, and they made the Alabama front seven look more like they should be playing at Alabama State. And I'm supposed to believe that if these two teams meet again, it's not gonna go down in much the same way as it did last time? Uh-uh. <laughs> Good job. Great, great overview. Okay, so the question is, do we say Clemson's number one now forever? Or do we just say this season because they won the national championship? I think for now, you for know, now? I, think, I think we're looking at it at a week by week, year by year basis at most. I think for now, Clemson is my top dog. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it is just because I think that that offense is so loaded and has so much talent They on had it. so many returners. It's yeah, basically it's, the same team. That team is just stocked at every single position. And I just think they've got a lot more opportunities to capitalize when one of their big stars isn't having a huge game. And I think that's what kind of sets them apart from everyone else. Yeah, I mean, it's close, like I said. Um, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm going to stick with Bama. But, I mean, Clemson, they are on the come up. And like I said, if they can win the national championship this year, then I think they got it. But I mean, Alabama, I still feel like they are on top. Both teams are loaded with players. So I mean, it definitely comes down to this season game by game. So it's, I feel like it's gonna change throughout the season, but I mean, we're gonna have to wait and see, so. There's another reason that I picked Clemson and it has to do with stuff that's happening off the field. The coaching turnover at Alabama to me just isn't sustainable. The Tide have seven, seven, New coaches this year, and it's already impacting recruiting. Julian Fleming, the number one wide receiver in the class of 2020, specifically cited Bama's coaching turnover as a reason why he didn't choose them. Four-star quarterback Carson Beck, also in the class of 2020, flipped from Bama to Georgia for similar reasons. So we can see that the coaching turnover at Alabama is already having an impact on recruiting, and that's when the whole program starts to go down. So we have two great quarterbacks. Who's the Heisman? Who's the front runner now? Ooh. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know. I mean, Trevor Lawrence, true freshman last year, looked great. I'm going to have to go with him. Um, he's just, I mean, he's, all, he's, he's big, he's physical, he has a size. He's all around just a great player. He even showed some running, running ability against Georgia Tech last week. So, I mean, I'm going to I'm gonna have to roll with uh, Trevor Lawrence. Well, I'd love to say Jalen Hurts yeah. <laughs> if that were an option. But I, I think I'm going with Tua. I think Tua was – I was really shocked Tua didn't win it last year. I think the only reason he didn't is because Kyler had one of the most incredible seasons in the history of college football. They had no choice but to give him to him. I think Tua is kind of the, the Heisman darling this year. I think he's got a great shot at it. But the big question with him is injuries. He's just got to stay healthy. And, you hate for that to be the big question mark with the player because nothing you can really do about that. But if Tua stays healthy, I think the Heisman's his to lose. That decide. I mean, before the season, the Heisman was pretty much Trevor Lawrence's to lose. He was the clear-cut favorite, as he should have been. But after that week one dud against Georgia Tech, I don't know. I feel like Tua might have the edge. I mean... I don't think I definitely think he's going to bounce back. I know it, was, it wasn't the best performance or it wasn't the performance that many people were expecting. But I mean, it's Trevor Lawrence. He did win them the national championship last year. He's going to bounce back and he's going to take this Clemson team very far. I just I also think that two is just going to have more opportunities for Heisman moments. He's going to be in a lot bigger games than Lawrence uh, is going to be playing in, in the ACC. You know, the LSU game is always a big game. Auburn game, if Auburn keeps winning, I really think that it's going to be about those Heisman moments and two is just going to get more shots at him. Absolutely. That's true. That's true. I agree with you there, Kemper. I think, you know, the ACC pretty much now just stands for another Clemson championship. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. Alabama is actually going to have some tougher competition and more opportunities for Tua to have those Heisman moments. Yeah, now, exactly. Now we're just getting started. So when we return here on Game Day U, we'll take a look at last week's top performers as well as a few players that have failed to live up to the expectations in week one. Three and out is next. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Game Day U. I'm Tevisillis. Coming up in an hour or two of our show, we take a look at less than an impressive opening week for the Big 12. But for now, three and out is on deck. So guys, let's get started with who was the most impressive impact player this week? Kemper? Well, I talked about him a little bit at the beginning of the show. For me, it is Jacob Eason from Washington. Jacob Eason had a huge game in his Washington debut, a transfer from Georgia. He went 27 for 36 with almost 350 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions. This guy is looking like a machine. He looks like he's easily been worth the wait for, for the Washington fans. And he could be the, key, could be the key to their playoff run if, uh, if Oregon falls off a little bit more. I still think Oregon can bounce back. But Jacob Eason, so impressive in week one. Crazy to think what he'd be doing with that Georgia offense right now if he had stayed and hadn't had his position taken by Jake Fromm. But I just think overwhelmingly, week one, he looked so efficient and so calm and collected. This is a guy who hadn't played football in almost two years. He, he stepped out there like it was just another day in the park. I, I really like J what I'm seeing from Jacob Eason. I think he could shoot up people's NFL draft boards this year if he keeps playing like he did in week one. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Exactly. Uh, well, you know, with, with the poor performance of Trevor Lawrence, I definitely think it allowed Travis Etienne to shine. That man had a monster game. He stole the show with his game one debut, and he had 205 yards. One went for 90 yards. He had three TDs. So, I mean, the man just went absolutely crazy that game. You're going to see the first one here. He had a 90 yard, which is actually, I think it is the longest run in, in Clemson history. He also only had 12 carries, but he managed to get 205 yards, which is the most in Clemson, Clemson history, which is so few carries. So, I mean, it, it has to go to Travis Etienne. He stepped up when he needed to. He carried this Clemson to victory. And I know they were playing Georgia Tech, but, I mean, he stepped up big, and he got the job done, and so he deserves the credit. So, uh, I don't know. He, he, I know Tra uh, Trevor Lawrence is the favorite for the Heisman on Clemson, but I think he definitely made his statement for this. And so he's, he's going to be a guy to watch out for as the season progresses, and he may even be on that Heisman to watch. We'll see. Maybe we'll have two Heisman candidates from the same team. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Interesting. Matt? Both of those guys had great performances, but the one who stood out to me the most was Bo Nix, Auburn's true freshman quarterback, playing in his first college football game in prime time against an Oregon team that many considered to be a playoff sleeper. Now, in the first half, 
it was pretty rough. He went just 6 of 18 for 91 yards and two interceptions. Just some bad throws. Kind of just blinded by the light a little bit. Uh, it's, you know, understandable for a true freshman, but still, he had his team down at the half. He could have folded. Nobody would have blamed him for folding, but he didn't. He came back in the second half, went 7 of 13 for 86 yards and two touchdowns, also led the game-winning drive. Now, for a true freshman, even though these numbers aren't exactly gaudy, for a true freshman playing in his first college game to shake off that kind of rough start and come back and lead his team to a victory, that kind of mental fortitude is something that everybody should be impressed with. Bo Nix, really? He, yeah. he didn't put up huge numbers, but he made the right plays when it counted. He had that crucial fourth and three run that set up that long touch, game winning touchdown pass. And sometimes that's more important than putting up huge numbers. It's making the right plays at the right time. Yeah, that is true. But I mean, I feel like Oregon pretty much gave it to him. Um, that, Oregon, they had I many opportunities to capitalize. Pass. And I mean, they didn't. he just, he eventually was going to get something. I, I mean, I agree Props with him, you. I do agree with you. Oregon really threw this game away. But, you know, like I said, a true freshman coming back after an awful first half and leading that game-winning drive, that is poise. That is what you want to see in your quarterback. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It was, it was, it was definitely a big moment for him, and he did step up. But, I mean, at the end of the day, it wasn't, it wasn't a good performance. But, I mean, like you said, he stepped up when he needed to, and, I mean, that's all that matters. He did it on about as big a stage as a week one stage can be. Exactly. It was in prime time, too. It was a prime time game. Huge. Oregon came in at number 11. They have a lot of hype around them. So, I mean, he got the job done. So. Now, guys, I'm kind of um, sad you didn't pick Jalen Hurts, but I'm going to get over that. <laughs> so who was the least impressive impact player this last week? Uh, well, we were just talking about Oregon. I'm going with Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert didn't necessarily have a bad game. He looked fantastic in the first half. Had some huge plays, a great crossbody throw in the second half, in the second quarter. But he just shut down in the second half. It, it looked like he lost his confidence to throw the ball deep. He, he, he needs to be able to string together four good quarters. Like I said, he didn't have a bad game, but this guy's projected to be the top quarterback prospect in this draft class. He came back for another year instead of going to the NFL. I gotta see more from him. I, I, think, I think Oregon could still put together a pretty nice season, but if Justin Herbert can't string together four good quarters of football, I mean, that's going to be it for the Ducks. Yeah, that's, that's funny you picked Justin Herbert. I'm actually going to go with Bo Nix. <laughs> um, I mean, like Yikes, I said, not I, about to pass I, out. Like I said, I know he had uh, a game-winning performance uh, in, his, in his season debut, but, I mean, it wasn't that impressive. 13-23, 168. He did have a couple of good throws, a couple of good runs here and, and, and to get started out with, but, I mean, he did also throw two costly interceptions that could have cost them the game. Um, like I said, luckily Oregon wasn't playing their best ball, so they did kind of shoot themselves in the foot. But I mean, he did step up when he needed to. Um, and like I said, that's all that matters. Do I think he's going to improve as the season goes on? Yes, with experience, you know, it'll come. They do have a tough schedule, so I mean, he'll get that grit as the season goes on. But I mean, as far as his, his game one performance, I mean, I don't, it, he definitely made an impact, but it wasn't uh, as impressive. But I mean, props to him for hanging in there. Um, it was a big stage, and I mean, he pulled it off. And I remember watching that last play. I honestly, I didn't think he was going to make it happen, but I mean, he proved me wrong, and he did. So I mean, not the best performance, but definitely made an impact. Yeah, I mean, but that's fair. But you have to look beyond the numbers. I'm looking Absolutely. at the intangibles here. Anyway, my least impressive impact performer was we talked about him, and got also Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> This man is playing Georgia Tech. He threw four interceptions in all of last year. He threw two in the first half against Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech. I mean, this is just a bad throw right to the defender. This one, he drops back. It's towards the end of the half. He's looking. He just kind of chucks it up. Why not? Except there's nobody there. Like. This was the guy who was supposed to be the front runner for the Heisman. And then, oh, here's another one that should have been picked. Yeah, I would have been pounding the turf there too. He got outshined by his own running back. And now uh, the Heisman race is like a five-way race again when he started the season as the clear favorite. I mean, outside of a 62-yard touchdown to T. Higgins, he was 12 of 22 for 106 yards 
and those two interceptions. That ain't it, Trevor. We've talked about Trevor Lawrence so much over the past year and a half, it's really easy to forget that he's a true sophomore. I mean, that kid was going to prom two years ago. Like You expect him to be so much better because he's like this, right. this king, this this goddess, but God. But he's it's not, the hair. It's the hair. It's, it's the, the hair. flow. It's yep. the flow. I mean, but if anything, that second interception, it was a bust play. I mean, I know you said there was no one there, but <laughs> technically he, I would say he had one interception. But, I mean, that last one he just kind of, it was about to be halftime. He threw it up. It, was, it looks bad that, on stats, but I mean. I that mean, second one on the run where there was nobody there, that was a bad decision. Yeah, bad I mean, decision. He is, he's still bad young decision. and he clearly needs to improve his decision making, but he's got all, the guy's got all the talent in the world. He can, he can bounce back from a week like this, but I mean, I, I completely understand why you picked him as your least impressive yeah. impact performer. That was a rough start for Trevor Lawrence. It's, it's, it's worrying to me. It's just worrying to me to see this kind of regression from Trevor Lawrence. I mean, we all watched the national championship game, yeah. right? Absolutely. That was supposed to be his coming out party. But it, I mean, he just, it, it, I need to see more from him. I need better from him. Okay, so what group of five school do you think is gonna have a New Year's Eve bowl? Well, this is tough, because I, as I looked at him, I, I, didn't, I didn't think anyone had an overwhelmingly great chance, but if I had to pick one, I think I'm going with Army. Army plays huge in big games. They nearly beat us last year. If you ask Ben, they probably would say they think they should have beat us last year. They've got Michigan coming up today. That's pretty much their toughest game of the year. After that, their schedule, they should be favored in every single game they play. Shouldn't be an overwhelmingly difficult schedule. I really think Army has a chance to run the table, and I really think they have a chance to beat Michigan today. Yeah, um, I'm gonna play it a little bit safe. And I'm gonna go with the team that's been, you know, doing it for quite a while. I'm gonna go with UCF. And the reason for that is I know a lot of people complain <laughs> that their schedule isn't as tough, but I mean, that's what gets them in. That's what helps them get in. So, I mean, they don't have a tough schedule. And I mean, the team, it's not like they have no skill. I mean, they competed with LSU last season and they didn't have McKenzie Milton. So I definitely think that they can get it done. Game one, they, they did something a little different. They had, you know, two QBs going out there. Brandon Wimbush, 12-23, 168, two, two TDs. And Dylan Gabriel, 9-13, 127 with three TDs. So, I mean, they got good quarterbacks on their hands. I guess it's just a matter of time when they decide, you know, who they're going to roll with. Or maybe they roll with two all season. I don't know. But I definitely think with their with their the strength of their schedule, I mean, it's not very tough. I definitely think it's going gonna, it's gonna to get them in easy. And, um, you know, like I said, we're playing it safe. So. Yeah. Matt, I think we have the same pick, so hit it. Yeah, I'm heading out to the Mountain West. I'm going with Boise State. The Broncos grabbed a huge win against Florida State in week one. Hank Bachmeyer was impressive in that game, but I want to talk about the defense because that is what's going to make Boise State so tough to beat. They caused havoc in the backfield in, at, at Florida State. They held the Seminoles to 99 rushing yards on 28 carries. Let me read that for you all again. 99 rushing yards on 28 carries. Last night, they played Marshall, held Marshall to 172 yards total, including zero in the second half. That means that all of us here at this table <laughs> had the same offensive output last night as Marshall did in the second half against Boise State. Great job, y'all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was a whole team effort, so <laughs> well, anytime. You know, let's not forget, Marshall also held Boise State to 14 points yesterday. That offense is not looking great. They've got a true freshman starting at quarterback. I don't have re very high expectations for Boise State. Yeah, I mean, I mean when, I, when it's all said and done, I definitely think that, I mean, it's, it's anybody's game at this point. Um, I just, I think you just have to kind of look down on who's going to get there the easiest. And I definitely think UCF, I mean, they've done it the past couple years, so I definitely think that they're going to be able to do it again. Um, like I said, with that strength of schedule, it definitely plays a role. And I mean, I, I just think they're going to cruise on through. They may not win their bowl game, but I mean, as long as they get there. Well, you know, and I think you're right, Kemper. It was an off night for the Boise State offense. But again, that's what makes it so impressive with the defense, because, mm -hmm. you know, even if the offense comes out and lays an egg, you know, the defense is going to be there to bail them out as they did last night. And another thing with uh, with Boise State is their schedule. We talked about yeah. you know who has an easier schedule. I honestly think Boise State has a really great chance to go undefeated this year. Their toughest uh, games remaining 
are uh, trips to BYU and Utah State. So I think they've got perhaps even a better chance than UCF, who has to play a Houston team that I think a lot of people are sleeping on. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's still early on, and it's going to be crazy towards the end of the season where we're like, man, we actually had, you know, this team going in. But, I mean, you know, based on what we got, you know, like I said, it's, it's still early, but, I yeah. mean, you just kind of got to go what you have, kind of go with what you have. So, I mean, you know, all great picks. I mean, I, I, de I, yeah. Pick. Yeah, I definitely think Boise State, you know, could squeeze in there. Maybe even Army, they can surprise us as well. But, I mean, you never know. We will see how it turns out. Exactly. Now we're halfway home of this edition of Game DU as the Sooners prepare to take on South Dakota. But when we come back, the Sooners Conference foes didn't exactly get to off to a smashing start in week one. Sam, Shiloh, Christian, and William break it down next. Welcome back to Game Day and you guys, back with the studio team outside Gaylord Memorial Stadium. Now, I said it was nice earlier. It was a beautiful day earlier. It's getting a little hot. It's heating, it's heating up just a little bit. I don't know how much we're enjoying it. We're going to have to kind of push through the pain the last couple blocks of the day here, but we're still very excited to be out here. Shiloh Sellers, Christian Nunley, William Sule. I'm going to break down a little Big 12 action for you guys now. Um, first week of the Big 12 last week. Kind of a weird week to base it off of. Three teams almost lost to an FCS team. So now yeah. Oklahoma playing South Dakota. I mean, we, we say it's an FCS opponent, but Iowa State, Kansas, and uh, who am I missing? Who am I missing at the end there? I, it's off the top of my head. My paper fell on the ground. This is uh, on the spot right now. But three teams pulling to FCS team Sule. Which team kind of stood out to you, whether in a good way or a bad way? Uh, I mean, I kind of gave him a lot, of, a lot of flack last week. Uh, I gave you a lot of crap last week for picking <laughs> Kansas. Be uh, a dangerous team in the Big 12 this I'm year. Dangerous. I... They almost lost to Indiana State. Indiana State, uh, famous alma mater. Who's to my Larry Bird? Anybody nice. else? I mean, nice. like, come on, cool. like, like Indiana State. I mean, they they to Kansas's credit, I will say they came back after being at the lost a fumble in the end zone to allow Indiana State to take the lead with 424 yeah. left in the game. They came back, drove down with two minutes left, and scored which is not typical of a Kansas team. Like, you would think that that, like, once they fumble in the end zone with four <laughs> minutes left, an <laughs> old Kansas over. team <laughs> just packs it in, and that's the end of it. But I, I think it's a little bit of symptomatic of what Les Miles is trying to do, maybe change the culture just a little bit. They came back, they scored to take the lead again, and then they did an end around, like, they did a reverse pass for the two-point conversion. It was like a little taste test of the Mad Hatter there. Mm. It was fun to see. Uh, and they were playing without Puka Williams to, again, credit what was almost a bad, bad loss for Kansas. But is there a bad loss for Kansas anymore? I mean, like, where they're at in their program, like, anything, a win is a win for anyone. So saying that Kansas <laughs> lost, almost lost to an FCS opponent doesn't mean as much as I think the other Big 12 schools almost lost. Listen, I think you echoed my point from last week. What I was saying with Kansas was it's not like they were going to be an overnight success. They weren't going to go from their history to an amazing team. I was saying that the culture is going to change. I think we saw that last week against Indiana State. In the past, you go down, you fumble four minutes to go, they're out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. with Les Miles as their head man, they're back in it, and they win that game. That's the kind of that's the kind of change I think we'll see from Kansas, a team that's not going to go down and out in the, sure. at the end of the game. They also have a guy whose name is Hassan Defense. Mm -hmm. Like he had a pick six. What's he, he got play? A Why pick did six? Play? No, <laughs> from Hassan Defense. Like that is an incredible, what incredible football name. Yeah. It's an all-time football guy move right there to have your last name be Defense, and you got a pick six to back it up. So I don't know if there's a lot else you can expect out of Kansas. It was definitely a close call, but it was nice to see them rally and kind of come back from that. Yeah, we're all rooting for you, son, defense, for sure. That, from, from <laughs> myself, from myself. Um, but what about your boys over at Iowa State? What, yeah, yeah, what was up with that? Northern Iowa. Oh, Northern Iowa. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my, I got that one. I got that one. <laughs> yeah, but my team to uh, kind of look out for was TCU. Okay. TCU, they, they didn't have the best game in the world. But they got an extremely important quarterback battle going on between mm -hmm. freshman uh, Max Dugan and Kent State transfer Alex Delton. They each kind of have their own specialties. 
Uh, Alex Delton is more of a running quarterback. We saw that in a, in a great run he had. Uh, he's one of those guys that's going to lower their shoulder and really get the first down when they need to. Sim kind of similar to Jalen Hurst that we see at Oklahoma, but I'm not comparing them sure. in any sort of in any way. <laughs> I'm both in orange. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying that they've got Whatever you say, styles. you know just, these three, we're, all three of us are going to look into it. Yeah, <laughs> but Max Dugan, on the other hand, however, is a, is a throwing quarterback. He was able to uh, put two in the uh, end zone through the air, uh, one on the ground. So he had a great afternoon. But it's an interesting quarterback battle to kind of watch unfold and see who's going to have the uh, keys to the kingdom. Because I don't think they're similar to Iowa State. I don't think they're one of those teams that can rely on two different quarterbacks throughout the season. So I think they'll have to choose one, and I'm excited to see uh, which quarterback they end up choosing. And, and TCU's always been one of those teams, too, that when, when they have a good quarterback, they're dangerous. They've yeah. been yes. one of the consistently best. I mean, they almost made the college football playoff a few years ago mm -hmm. because they had good quarterback play, and since then have not. So if they can figure out that question mark, Gary Patterson's always had a good defense and they can be dangerous. Oh, absolutely. You know who wasn't dangerous? Uh, <laughs> Iowa Sule State. Sule's picked to finish to number two. Yes. Northern Sule Iowa. Sule sung their praises. Wow. And I agreed. I thought they were going to be a really big sleeper, but they snoozed on the opportunity, in my opinion. They were sleeping. I yeah. mean, Northern Iowa. I saw them, yeah. And overtime! I think that's what really Triple killed overtime. me was the fact that they had to come back in overtime in order to win by three. <laughs> by three in overtime. That is wild. They scored me. more points in overtime than they did in the first four quarters. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, well, they it had. It definitely wasn't a good look for my take by any stretch no, of the no, imagination. No, that was no, not sweat. At all. The entire game, I was like, "Come on, guys!" Sule We're gonna lose, messages, lose to a big Sule 12 sending team. messages in our group me. Man, my I take was looking good right now. Sweat. <laughs> <laughs> well, they threw up three in the first, nothing in the second, seven in the third, and sixteen in or er, yeah, seven in the third, three in the fourth, and sixteen in overtime, which is wild. Now everyone has been talking about this Iowa State defense. And I think that they did live up to a Big 12 defense, which doesn't <laughs> say much. Yeah. But one thing that's really nice for them is that they have depth. They've got options. And at this early in the season, this is when you're playing around, you're moving them around. I mean, quite honestly, it was the battle of the worst place. And I think that you can only move up from here. So. The next guy I want to talk about is Brock Purdy. He had a phenomenal freshman year last yeah. year. Shows flashes of brilliance. But the question is, can he keep being the guy? And that's what I was unsure of. I think him paired with De uh, Deshante Jones is a match made in heaven. Jones had a great game. He was probably one of the only bright spots on the field for Iowa State. But I just think that Purdy started making mental mistakes. Uh, Tom Manning spoke about wanting him to stay in the pocket to almost kind of relax and keep calm during those pressure situations. And he took it a little too far to the point where he was getting sacked, his throws were getting slapped down. I mean, it was just a little too much love yeah. in the pocket, in my opinion. Um, however, I think that, you know, moving forward as they go into Big 12 play, I don't think the defense is going to be able to stop Big 12 offenses. Yeah. No way. I think Brock Purdy, I think that he will continue to improve, but he still is just so young. You can see those mental errors and just like him questioning himself, a lot of things he talked about was doubting his receiving core. That is a death sentence for a football team if you don't feel comfortable enough to throw the ball to get it out and make some plays yeah. it was little it was it was short game and it didn't work out yeah yeah i mean someone's got to emerge on those skill positions after uh you know after alan lazard is gone now hakeem butler's now mm -hmm. in the nfl david montgomery got drafted so deshante jones stepping up not a, a good replacement they're going to need more of him right. but i want to talk real quick about the former quarterback that was around here who's now out in morgantown west virginia austin kendall West Virginia was that 13, by the way. I was thinking yeah, about yeah, it. I, I managed to pick my paper up. West Virginia almost lost to James Madison. Yeah. Austin Kendall had an all right game, Oof. 260 yards, a couple touchdowns. But, man, the rest of the team, you could tell there's just not much around them, can yeah. Listen, one thing I want to uh, mention that James Madison has typically been in the past five, ten years an one FCS the FCS powerhouse. Teams, yeah, yeah they've, they've definitely shown that they can compete with some of the D1 single-A teams. So as much as 
West Virginia might have looked porous in this game, and boy, did they look porous. Um, I definitely think. Hey, you said dissonance earlier. I was gonna, I was gonna say like, okay. Um, um, I just think this uh, kind of dismal performance on West Virginia's part is kind of uh, shadowed a little bit by the strength of James Madison. So I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I definitely think they could have been better, but. And the fact that James Madison has been as good as they have in the past shows that it's not the worst uh, close game in the world. Well, what'd you see from uh, Austin Kendall? I Saturday? mean, like I mean, like it's, I think it proves to me at least why he transferred. Like he, he mm-hmm. clearly is yeah, not definitely. the guy here. He was not mm-hmm. going to be the guy at OU. No. Um, and I think, I mean, even with Jalen, before we even knew Jalen was going to be here, uh, Kendall was kind of had a, a foot out the door. Yeah. So yeah. To, and they're not going to have. They don't get to – like, Iowa State, one of my points, they have a bye week this week at least. They get to kind of recoup before they have to play Iowa. Uh, West Virginia's playing Missouri, who also – or they lost. Uh, West Virginia did not. They, they're playing Missouri, who – a team that was kind of a dark horse sleeper in the SEC East, and they looked like trash, too. They lost to Wyoming. So, and like, so, I like thought Kelly Josh Brown, Allen left. I thought he wasn't on Wyoming anymore. He did. <laughs> they still are, they're putting, they're winning football games. So I mean, I don't know. But maybe he went back, got his mask. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if Austin Kendall can rebound, get this. I mean, it sounds weird saying rebound after a win, but mm-hmm. all all these teams we've talked about are going to have to rebound. I mean, oh, the yeah. Big Twelve went undefeated, which good for the Big Twelve, but it was by fine, fine margins. So it'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see how they compete against a team of the caliber of Missouri. Quickly, before we go to break, out of those three teams, West Virginia, uh, Kansas, and then Iowa State, which close call worries you the most moving forward? Shiloh, we'll start with you. Ooh. uh, I mean, I feel like you're going to say Iowa State, but if you are, We know what I'm worried about. Oh, yeah, we know 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 what Will's going to talk about. I think for sure uh, Iowa State. Yeah. Just because this was the most hype season start for them. And I think everyone just expected so much more. They really, I expected them not to be a top two contender in the Big 12, Suley. <coughs> but <laughs> to be top three, top four, to be in it enough to make you nervous when you play them. And I think that they sh- like shot that away. Yeah. Like after seeing the, especially the defense, I think is what kind of nailed that in for me. It's just because. Big 12 is known for their offenses. Yeah. And if you can't handle that offense, don't come in here. And the yeah. defense is also for Iowa State returning a lot of players. Yeah, it, sure. it, it's a it's a disappointing uh, disappointing game for mm. Iowa State. But it's a yeah. long season. It's yeah. a start, so we'll see. They, they, got a lot they have a bye week. Yeah. Uh, my, my pick would definitely be West Virginia. I was uh, expecting, a, not expecting a lot, per se, from this team. But I just wanted to see the best out of Austin Kendall. He's a guy that came out of OU. Right. So he's going to he's gonna rep OU wherever he goes. So I definitely wanted to see a little bit more from him. But I didn't see as much as I had wanted to see. So i I just looking forward to seeing him hopefully make some improvements throughout the season and become a, a lot better of a quarterback than he has showed last week. Sule? Yeah, I mean, I think the my choice here is pretty obvious. I, no. I kind of staked my reputation on Iowa State. <laughs> yeah. that, that was, it was a hot take. So let's like we we're all gonna miss on a couple of hot takes this year. Uh, so let's True. not drag me through the coals yet. But I really did. I I believed in Matt Campbell. I believed in that team, and I really believed in Brock Purdy. And he did. He they let me down. I mean, they won. <laughs> they let me down. So there there isn't anything to say. I mean, oh, you almost lost to Army last year. Like there have been teams that have had close calls and rebounded. Like it's not yeah. unthinkable. Yeah. I mean, hit, heck, if they even lose, if they lose that game. They're still like it doesn't matter until Big 12 play starts. Like yeah. they can still make the Big 12 championship if they can get the momentum going. So I was very concerned with Iowa State. Uh, I mean, we've talked about the defensive woes. I think that that is very concerning. But to me, like you said, in the Big 12, you've got to be able to put up points. And if they don't have a Hakeem Butler, if they don't have a David Montgomery on this team, who's going to step up at those skill positions to allow Brock Purdy to feel comfortable? Because mm-hmm. when you've got a guy like Hakeem Butler, I think that had a lot to do with his comfort level. Because if you've got a guy like that, it's like how Tony Romo was with Des Bryant. Mm-hmm. If you've got a guy that you know, if you're in a pickle, you can just throw it up to him and he's going to go he's get it. Get it. Yeah. That is so much weight lifted off mm-hmm. your shoulders as a quarterback, and he doesn't have that anymore. So yeah. that, you're coming into your sophomore season, a lot of expectations. You're, I mean, Brock Purdy is the guy. He was not the guy last year. Montgomery was the guy, and then Butler was the guy, and then he was the guy. He was third at best. He's now the guy, and he's got to be able to make that adjustment and prove that he can be the guy. 
Yeah, definitely going to be looking forward to see how all three of those teams kind of adjust as the season goes on. That's going to do it for us right now. When we come back, the studio team is taking over again. Tevis Hillis and the guys will have a little bit more talk about the college football and national landscape. Stay with us. Back here in our Gaylord Hall studios here on Game Day U, Tevis Hill is alongside Matt Bowling, Austin Hernandez, and Kimber Ball. Guys, it seems like the Pac-12 is consistently the most overlooked Power 5 conference, but there are already plenty of big storylines out west after just one week of play. Let's dive in. The front runner in the Pac-12 is already down for the count. You've seen the highly plenty of teams. But after the loss of Auburn, it's time to sink and swim for the Ducks. They'll have to play perfect football from here on out to try and preserve their hopes of a CFP berth in Justin Herbert's senior season. Meanwhile, USC will have to scramble after starting quarterback JT Daniels torn his ACL in meniscus a week ago. While Daniels lost for the season, they'll turn to freshman Kendon Slavs. In a makers break year for coach Clay Helton, the Trojans are already feeling the pressure just one game into the season. USC isn't the only team with a single caller on the shelf. Stanford quarterback KJ Costello is out indefinitely after a brutal hit for the head last week. His back Davis Mills is now tested with the, the ship afloat. The Cardinals have always been a run for first team. So look for tailback Trevor Speaks to get plenty of carries. So guys, Pac-12, let's talk about it. We're excited. We've been ready. Yep. Here we go. Gotta love talking about the Pac-12. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, a, what an exciting dynamic conference. I really think this year in the Pac-12, it's a two-team race. I, I, I think it's Oregon and it's Washington. Oregon, everyone needs to just calm down, take a deep breath. It's week one, okay? I think we're gonna get, I think we're gonna get, the Oregon's gonna improve, they're gonna fix their, they're gonna fix some of their problems. They're gonna bounce back. They've got Nevada this week. I think they've got a good shot at bouncing back. Yeah, I mean, coming into the season, there was a lot of hype. You know, a lot of people were saying whether or not a Pac-12 team can get in that fourth spot, you know, into the college football playoffs and kind of represent the Pac-12. But, I mean, obviously with Oregon losing, that, that's a big blow. Um, so, I'll, like I said earlier, we, we have so much little to go off of, so I'm going to play it safe. I'm actually going to go Washington. Um, you know, they've kind of they've won it uh, two out of the last three years. Uh, defensive coordinator Jimmy Lake, he's doing a great job with the defense. Transfer Jacob Eason is, I mean, he had a great debut, like you mentioned earlier. So, I mean... All in all, uh, I think Washington's gonna, they're, they're gonna be able to pull it off. I mean, I can see Washington and Utah meeting up in that Pac-12 championship, but I mean, I, I still think I, I could feel uh, Washington being able to pull it off. They had a great performance against Eastern Washington. I know it's Eastern Washington. They're supposed to, but I mean, Jacob Eason, he looked great. Er, yes, Jacob Eason looked great in his, in his debut, 27 to 36, 349 yards and four TDs. He looks like he fits well in this offense very well. He looks promising. I think he's going to take this team far. Um, if they can keep it up, who knows? Maybe they, they will be able to squeeze into that into that fourth spot when it comes time. But I mean, like I said, we don't have much to go off of. But if I had to pick a winner of the Pac-12, I'm definitely going with Washington. Well, again, I get the deciding vote. But this time, <laughs> I'm with Austin. I think it is Washington's conference to win. They just looked better all around than Oregon did in week one. Yes, different opponents, but I mean, just look at that offense. Jacob Eason, in his first game in nearly two years, threw uh, for 349 yards and four touchdowns. 157 of those yards and three of those touchdowns came uh, were to senior wide receivers Andre Bocelli and Aaron Fuller, who we just saw earlier making that incredible grab in the end zone. And Austin, you said it's Eastern Washington, but the thing is, Eastern Washington is the number four FCS team. So there are no pushovers. I really like the way that this Huskies offense has clicked in the first game of the season. I'm looking forward to watching them as the season progresses. Yeah, Chris Peterson, he's done a great job with this Washington team. He's definitely steered them in the right direction. Now, for Oregon, it's not too late. Uh, the loss is coming very early. It was to a good, well, I mean, the performance wasn't good, but it 
they are promising, uh, a ranked Auburn team. So, I mean, if they can get it together, if Justin Herbert can, can pull this offense together and they can string things out in the defense, I definitely think that they can save their season and they can still make it in. So, I mean, it just it comes down to how they you know take it game by game. If they can pull it together, I definitely I can still see them winning the Pac-12 as well. The big question marks on Auburn or on Oregon's schedule is really just two games. It's at Stanford and at Washington. Stanford's already down a quarterback, so that makes that game just a little bit easier. Washington's going to be the big one, though. That's pretty much, I think, could decide the Pac-12 championship. Washington, I didn't realize this, Washington has not lost at home since 2016. That is a really, really impressive home field advantage. Yeah. So if, if Oregon can squeak by a game in that, I think I think it's theirs to lose. Yeah, and that's another thing for Washington. Every tough game they have, Oregon, Washington State, Utah, everything besides Stanford is at home. And like you said, yep. they're, they, they pretty much yeah. they have it made. So all they got to do is win at home, beat Stanford away, and they're in. Yeah, three toughest games at home, Oregon, Utah, Washington State. Now, Oregon, you know, I talked about this earlier, but to me, the Ducks just can't finish. We saw bad execution, bad play calling in the second half against Auburn. I mean, fourth and one, and they hand it off behind the shotgun. Oh, they'll never see that one coming, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, it. It, it looked like they were rolling for a second. It, it looked like Oregon was getting ready to steamroll Absolutely. Auburn in this. Absolutely. I mean, Bo Nix couldn't get it together. I don't know what happened at the end. I don't know if they just they, they choked. They, like you said, they couldn't finish. Um, but, I mean, they had that game in their hands, and they just they let it slip. I, I really I am still so baffled by that second <laughs> half by Oregon. Justin Herbert is – I picked him as my least impressive impact player. But that's just because I've got high expectations for the kid. You know, he's supposed to be one of the top quarterback recruits in this draft class. And he just didn't perform in that second half. And I don't know if it was a coaching decision or if he had lost confidence to throw the ball deep, but the offense just came to a halt in the second half. And you're not going to be able to do that. I mean, they already didn't get away with it against Auburn. You're definitely not going to get away with that in Washington or at Stanford. Those are two very tough places to get a win. But I really have a lot of confidence in Justin Herbert. I think he can string together a great rest of the season and pull the Ducks back up and get them to a Pac-12 championship. Yeah, like, it's just disappointing, especially for Oregon fans. I, I know some people who actually had Oregon squeezing into the playoffs this year and representing the Pac-12, so I mean, it's just, it's just a low blow to have them go out and perform like that and, and drop the ball because now, you know, you just kind of have to wait and see if they're going to be able to bounce back and they're going to be able to make it in, so. Even winning the Pac-12, I have a very difficult time seeing Oregon making the college football yeah. playoffs. Yeah, yeah. I, I think... I think two SEC teams, yeah. a hopefully kinda, a Big 12, Big 12 winner, and Clemson. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I really have a hard time seeing that. Your best bet at this point for the Pac-12 is Washington. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I absolutely think if, if anyone from the Pac-12 is going to make it, it's going to be Washington, even though I think Oregon can still win that conference. Yeah, exactly. They have to win at Washington. Yeah. Uh, Washington also hosts some of the other tougher teams in that conference, including Utah, Utah made the conference title game last year. They're a solid team. They played them pretty close, but pound for pound, I just don't feel like Utah has the talent to knock off Washington, especially not at home. I mean, you know, give me Bocelli and Fuller over any two Utes defensive backs. I'll take the boys in purple every time. Yeah, I mean, but do you think this could be the year that, that you know, Washington, obviously we're talking a lot about Washington, how they've, they've been able to dominate. Do you think this is the year that Washington State maybe could kind of to kind of pull through and kind of make the name for themselves? Or? You know, Washington State, I have nothing but love and respect for our greatest national treasure, Mike Leach. Love that Thank man. you. I I've been waiting man. to add in his <laughs> name. Mike Leach fans over here. He's but, a great interview guy also. But Washington State, they lose five of their top seven defensive backs from last season, which they relied on them pretty heavily last year to support a shaky run defense. But I think so, Mike can work with little. I think he can work with absolutely. little talent and keep on pushing his players. It's fair, but again, you know, I'm not sure the talent is Isn't quite there. there. I it, mean, Washington has seen a pretty solid uptick yeah. in recruiting. No. They've got some blue chip guys coming in. So I think they're kind of starting to grab a hold on this conference. I think Washington State could honestly make some noise. I was really impressed with them last week. Their quarterback, Anthony Gordon, 420 yards, five touchdowns. And that's, you know, a big product of that Mike Leach, Mike Leach mm -hmm. offense, that air raid offense that we kind of run here now. But 
I, I really think they can make some noise. I think there's some weak defenses in the Pac-12 this year, aside from maybe Utah and Washington's defense looked really strong in week one. But I think Washington State can absolutely, maybe not win the Big Te or the Pac-12, but they can ruin someone's season. They, they can definitely be a thorn in someone's side. Same way Iowa State can be in the Big 12. Mm -hmm. I think they can just really be a pest to someone in the Big 12 and ruin someone's season. Yeah, I feel like every conference has a team that does play spoiler yeah, every absolutely, season. Absolutely. And I mean, Mike Leach, he's done a great job with that program, so I definitely can see that happening. I mean, I don't, I don't see them. I mean, I see them having a good season, but as far as maybe possibly winning the Pac-12, I don't see it. But I mean, like you said, ruining somebody's season, being that team that – you know, tests the team and, and, and takes them to deep waters and comes out with a win, you know, who knows. I definitely, I could see that happening, but, I mean, I don't know. I, just, I still think it's going to be some time before Washington State, you know, makes a name for themselves. And remember, too, just like Oregon and Utah, Washington State has to go into Washington to play yeah. the Huskies. Yeah. I mean, Washington's already been dominant in the Apple Cup for the past few years. Uh, I have very little reason to believe that that streak won't continue. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Now, when we come back, we'll send the, you back out to Sam Brown and Shiloh S Sellers, but stick around. It's Game Day U. Welcome back to Game Day U. I'm Meredith Mulkey coming to you from the top of Gaylord College at the University of Oklahoma, ready to talk some Sooner football. So let's take it back to week one when we discussed if it's even reasonable for us to have Jalen Hurts in the Heisman conversation. There's obviously some big expectations surrounding him with Oklahoma producing the last two Heisman winners in Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. So to start the season, Jalen was tied for third in the polls according to Westgate with Justin Fields from Ohio State and Adrian Martinez of Nebraska. But after a historic week one performance with 508 yards and six touchdowns against Houston. Jalen has made his way to the number one spot, surpassing Trevor Lawrence and former teammate Tua Tagovailoa. Now it's only week two of college football, but if Jalen can stay consistent and keep putting up the numbers he did against Houston, there's a good chance he'll be keeping Sooner fans dreams alive and continuing the Heisman streak here at Oklahoma. What's up, Sooner fans? We're hitting the books here on Game Day U with South Dakota coming to town. Now, none of our regular contributors really displayed any interest in doing this segment with us this week. Must be because there's not a whole lot to talk about, but thankfully, we have Kelsey here with us. Kelsey, what's the scouting report on the Yotes? Well, Parker, there's only one thing you need to know. F-C-S. Good stuff, Kelsey. Well, with that, we send you back outside to Sam and the gang, guys. Thanks for that, and welcome back to Game Day U. Back with the studio team for one more go around, guys, and then we are packing up and going right inside. I'm I'm starting to drip a little <laughs> sweat right now. I've got to say, yeah. I can't wait till three o'clock when I'm standing out in the north end zone, and I'm just I might lose like five pounds. We'll see what happens. Hey, you're the one wearing shorts, man. We are all sweating on your pants. It's because so I knew I knew I'd be sweating like we're this. Ready. I, I was prepared. So yeah. Shiloh Sellers, Christian Nunley, William Sule, we're back here outside Gateway Memorial Stadium with our favorite part of the show. Final words, call outs, score predictions. Let's just dive right into it. Sule, okay. your final word. Uh, my final word is improve. Uh, we. Like I touched on it earlier, Jalen Hurts is not was not happy with the team's performance against Houston despite the pretty resounding win. Uh, this team needs to improve defensively, offensively. I think other than Jalen Hurts, there's a lot of guys that need a lot of improving. They have a lot to do defensively, schematically, with a lot of different things that, that can go on. So I think if this team wants to take its next step, it has to improve on all sides of the ball. Didn't get a turnover last week. Alex Grinch, I'm sure, hammered that into his players' brains. Turnovers, turnovers, turnovers are his keys mm -hmm. to every single game. They have to improve in that area. You could, yeah, you can tell how disappointed he was after that game, too, yeah. the no takeaways. Yeah, one thing they tried to echo in practice is turnovers. So they, if they don't get a turnover in practice, they can't even leave practice. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully they're not allowed to leave the stadium. If they don't get a turnover. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But my word, my final word is going to be complacent. This is one of those games uh, it's very easy to get complacent against an FCS team that's not as talented as you are. Don't get, don't get complacent. Rack up those stats and really show Sooner fans and everyone in the media that OU's about that action. 
choice. I agree. Um, my word is going to be annihilate, and it has a little bit to do with what y'all guys are going on. Yeah, I was going for blood today. Yeah. <laughs> I want them to annihilate the doubts. That goes for Jalen, the offensive line, defense. They've got to lock it in this week. South Dakota's the perfect opponent to show everyone what you've got. You get to show out a little bit. You get to take some chances. I want them to annihilate South Dakota because they should. And uh, I want a cleaner play by defense. And so I just want them to annihilate kind of all those flags that were thrown at the very end of the game. Um, that's really all I've got, though. There you go. My final word last week was baseline because I wanted this to be a baseline for kind of where they need to improve on both sides of the ball. Today, my final word is an opportunity. Today's game is really an opportunity to fine tune those pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, Jalen was disappointed after the game. On Tuesday, he said the team needed to be more crisp. Alex yeah. Grinch, like we just mentioned, no turnovers. That's something that they had, they've been harping for six months almost, and they didn't get any takeaways, and that's something that they're, they need to improve upon. The kicking game, I think that's something that, that <laughs> needs to improve obviously the, the situations will be a little different sure. it won't be as high pressure yeah. but someone's got to stand out among that race so mm -hmm. this is an opportunity really for several players to kind of stand out cement their spots and if there's those position battles that are still kind of ongoing and really just fine-tune those those little things because it's going to start picking up pretty soon with that trip to california next week so mm -hmm. uh call outs will you uh, my con is Kennedy Brooks. I My word was improve, and I don't think it applies to anyone better than Kennedy Brooks. Four carries for 46 yards is not going to get the job done. It's just not. If you're going to be a guy in this offense, and I talked about Ramondre Stevenson, he's a guy waiting right behind you to take those carries if you don't improve. Brooks was a guy last year that was an incredible addition to a team that lost Rodney Anderson and needed a guy to step up. He can't continue. Like This is a team that if we're going to be a if OU plans to be a dynasty. They have to be the kind of team that has guys at every position willing and ready to compete. And Kennedy Brooks, I'm afraid, came into this year thinking his spot was pretty secure, when it's not. In reality, he needs to be willing and ready to prove that he is the number two guy, because he's, he's behind Trey Sermon. I think everyone understands mm -hmm. that. I think he understands that. But if he's not ready to go, then he's going to get replaced. So I think a guy like that with his talent could be a leader in this team, and if he's not putting out the work, he's not going to get play. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's crazy. Guys at Oklahoma are held to such a high standard. It's you it, could have one good game one week, one bad game the next, and you're gone. You're, you're, you're in the back <laughs> it, It's yeah. tough. It's, it's tough. the beast. Yeah, four for forty-seven. That's like shooting three for five from the beyond the arc <laughs> and having yeah. having a bad game. Like that, <laughs> that's tough. My call out is going to be Parnell Modley. Parnell Modley is a guy uh, we've seen have some bright spots and some doubt spots. Last year against Texas, he had a numerous uh, slew of great plays, but we're going to need that consistent play, especially without Trey Norwood uh, on the defensive side of the ball. They're really going to need a corner to step up. We saw uh, Trey Brown kind of make some plays, but I need Parnell Motley to show his experience and show his uh, depth in this team and really make some plays. I'm calling out Jalen Hurts. I know that we've talked a lot about the great Jaylen game. Jalen Hurts is calling out Jalen Hurts. <laughs> we talked about the great game that he had. Yes, he did have a great game. However, being in the press box, seeing everything unfold, he did make a few mistakes, one of which that really stood out to me. You brought up CD, who flew under the radar. He missed an opportunity with CD being wide open on the 20-yard line to go for a guy in the red zone that was fully covered. It didn't happen. So, Jalen, I'm calling you out to really step up, to have the solid mentality, to trust your guys and throw the ball. You're not a running back, and I don't want to see you run. I want to see you pass. I want to see that passing ability. I've talked about it. I feel like all show now. And I, I need you to prove yourself that you are as great as Kyler, as Baker. We want number three on that Heisman, number three. We're not complacent at number two. So I've got to call you out for that because right now you're subpar for me. I think that Oklahoma demands more. Subpar. All tough. right, hot take Woo. of the day goes to Shiloh Sellers. 500 yards, I, 60 I saw the, complacent. I don't know. I, so he's far. not a running back. No, yeah, I don't no, want no, the no. rushing yards, you know what I mean? Coming. Like we just get seeing it. he but made some so bad far. decisions in my opinion, just watching him from the press box, guys that – he threw two. I don't think he should have thrown two times that he kept the ball, but I don't think he should have kept the ball. He had nice slants, nice keepers, but there were still some mistakes that I think that OU just doesn't have the room for in their quarterback. Yeah. yeah. That's part of what I was saying earlier. It, I mean, he had a great game, 500-something yards, right. six touchdowns. 
But from the field, it didn't feel like that. Exactly. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I, I do, yeah, I yeah, we you get where you're coming from, yeah. for sure. Take all right. that hot take. <laughs> you guys all called out players in your, in, in your call outs. Yeah. I'm going to go a little different. I'm going to call out you guys at home, Sooner Nation. I'm calling out the fans. Woo! Now, last week, the whiteout, the atmosphere was incredible. Everyone was there through the third quarter. The stadium was jam packed, the energy was there. That was Houston. This is South Dakota. The Sooners will be 2 0 tonight, there's no doubt about that. But that doesn't mean that the fans should be the guys to leave right at halftime. I was never the guy to leave at halftime just because. I think as fans, you could really impact the confidence of these players in the third quarter. These backups, the freshmen, Jaden Jaden Davis, Woody Washington, the younger guys, Marcus Stripling, guys that don't get a lot of playing time but need that confidence. The fans can be there if they're allowed the entire time until, you know, obviously like it was the Houston game, so it's kind of out of reach. That does so much for the players' confidence. It, 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 would, do, it would do leaps and bounds for them moving forward, I think. Yeah. So, final score predictions, Sule. What do you got? Sule was the closest one last week. So. Yeah, let the record show I had the best score prediction last week. I'm hoping to do so again. <laughs> you also uh, said Iowa State was the second best. I mean, hey, come on. Now. So tally we, mark and then he rates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My score is 50 to 10, uh, which is Ooh, not a, uh, would fit into your annihilate word, Shiloh. Absolutely, absolutely. I think this team should have no problems dispatching what is a subpar opponent. Uh, not to be too harsh to South Dakota, it's just not It's just not a game that they're going to be close in. What I think could be the problem here is if this defense is still trying to improve. This is a game that the defense can come out and prove to not only themselves but the rest of the country that they can hold people to less. Like all last year, Oklahoma only held one opponent to less than 400 yards, and that was Army, mm -hmm. and they held them to 355. I want to see this <laughs> defense hold South Dakota to under 300 yards this year, yeah. today and prove that they can be in a league kind of unit. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go 42 to 10. I think, as you said, it's gonna be a complete annihilation, I think. Um, and I don't really see <laughs> I don't really see much of an opportunity for South Dakota to really uh, sneak and walk away out of Norman with a win. So, it, I mean, it's gonna be a huge discrepancy. I believe the spread is 41 and a half. I don't think OU is gonna cover, and I could see a touchdown either way for South Dakota and Oklahoma. But I'm going to have to go 42 to 10. I don't think uh, we are as prolific as point scorers as we have been in the past. Okay. But um, I think we take a little bit more time to score just because the way our offense is set up and the, our inability to really uh, score deep and fast. So I think uh, I think my final score would be 42 now, to 10. Now the graphic at home says 56-17 is on the graphic, according to my producer, Parker Thune. Really? That's what he said. That's what I, he that's, said. That's what I'm hey, saying. If at you two, said the, the inability to put up 56, then yeah, that is. I think it. I think it could be. That's what I was saying. Touchdown yeah, get uh, for high. either team. Yeah, but yeah. I, I'm gonna have to go 42 to 10. Okay, cool. I'm gonna go 45-17. I, I agree with you. I don't think that OU's offense is drilling out those uh, touchdowns like they once have. Yeah. Um, and I'm giving 17 to South Dakota just because of the depth issue for the Sooner defense. I'm afraid, especially that last half, that they might cause a little slips and that South Dakota might get some opportunities. Uh, but we're just I think all the final ones. <laughs> right. Today. We're just tying it all in. We're integrating um, integrating section. But yeah, <laughs> I I think OU OU should win. I think OU will win. I think that we're gonna see a lot change, but I think that they are gonna improve from that last week. But I just I can see the defense kind of starting to slip up and kind of falter towards the end just because they don't have the depth they need to be solid all the way through. Yeah, I mean, you talk about annihilation, wait till you hear my score prediction. 66-13 Sooners today. Sheesh. You heard me right, 66 to 13. Sheesh. I think this OU <laughs> offense comes out of the gates with, a, with, with kind of that energy that we saw last so, week with yeah. Houston. They're gonna keep piling on the points. And then I think even though these starters may be done by halftime, I mean, we'll see how the game goes, I think Lincoln Riley's really going to want to see what he's got in his backups in Tanner Mordecai, Spencer Rattler, some of his younger running backs and stuff like that. So you think I think we're going to see some Rattler today. I think we're going to see some Spencer Rattler that actually today. I think, I think we see. I think we see about a quarter of Mordecai, maybe about a half quarter of Spencer Rattler, yeah. kind of just to see what Lincoln Riley's right got there, in man. those options. So I think they keep piling on those points. I've got 66 to 13, wow. guys. Real quick before we go. The other, the guys in the studio are going to break down some of those top national matchups. But real quick, what's one matchup today that you are very excited for, Will? 
Um, I think for me, it's like I talked about CD Lamb. I, I want to see him come out and establish himself as the guy for Jalen to throw to. Like Jalen Hurts came in this spring, is still trying to. He's not like Baker. He's not like Kyler. He didn't have a year or more to really develop that relationship with his wide receivers. So I think what CD Lamb and these guys need to do, I think they need to build that trust so that Jalen Hurts doesn't have to run, so that he can trust these guys to go up and get balls. I mean, we've seen CD Lamb go up and go get some footballs and yeah. I think he has still not only more than capable he's got he's he's had a whole off season to get better and he's the kind of guy he's a hard worker I want to see him emerge as the number one option for this team and build that trust with Jalen Hurts so I think this is a good time for him to separate himself from what will un- undoubtedly be uh, maybe not the fastest secondary that he's going to face this year so I'd love to see CD Lamb come out and Real quick, quick so. Christian, who do you got? Matchup wise within OU or what matchup wise within the national landscape? You know what? Whatever you're feeling, man. I'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing West Virginia. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing West Virginia and um, Missouri. I- I'm really looking forward to seeing that matchup. There's a, I believe Missouri is 14 point favorites. And they lost last week to Wyoming. To Wyoming. Like I, I don't know why they're favored so heavily against West Virginia, who didn't have the best week last week, but. I'm looking to see uh, if Kelly Bryant, two transfers, Kelly Bryant and Austin Kendall, uh, see who's going to come out on top. I put my money on West Virginia to cover, so You got West please. Virginia covering? But you yes. got Missouri winning? No, I don't. No, you got West Virginia No, winning. yes, I, I do. Excuse me. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I do have. I have West Virginia covering the spread, the 14-point spread, winning. but I have Missouri winning. Okay. Interesting. Shiloh, Interesting. Rat, close us out. Well, I guess I say, I'll say a little bit of both, what, what Will said and what Christian said. Um, so, within the Sooners, I'm looking at, um, oh, I just lost my, tra- Trey Sermon. Um, I, <laughs> lost a train of there. Yeah, I totally It's still blanked. kind of early for us. We've been, up, we've been up a lot. I'm hungry. <laughs> Anyways, um, Trey. I'm looking nice. forward nice. to uh, seeing him as a running back. I think that he can be the guy. Uh, as of nationally, uh, I'm really excited for the LSU Texas match just oh, yeah. because a lot of questions on whether Texas is back. And I feel I don't even remember who they played last week, but it was one of those teams where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, they won. Oh, yes, yes, that's who it was. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing more of a stiffer uh, kind of opponent in LSU. But I, I would just want to know is Texas back? Obviously, Sam's the man. But uh, <laughs> thank you, via UT, right? You're gonna make me uh, cry. Don't lie to the guy. <laughs> but uh, I just really want to see overall what Texas is looking at, um, and I'm excited to kind of just see what they're working with. To be no, honest, no, no breakdown, nothing. Who wins that game, Texas or LSU? Uh, LSU. LSU. I'm hoping Texas, but I'm thinking LSU. I think LSU too. I'm going to go Texas. I'm going to change the mold a little bit. I'm going to go Texas pulling the win off in Austin. College game day. Going to look real good for the Big 12. That's going to do it from here with the remote team. Thanks to my analyst, Shiloh Sellers, Christian Nunley, William Sule. We are done today. Uh, When we come back after the commercial break, Tevis Hillis and the rest of the guys in studio, Austin Hernandez, Kemper Ball, Matt Bowling, they're going to break down all the top national matchups. They're going to throw in some uh, predictions in there, and you're not going to want to miss it. Stay tuned. Welcome back to our Gaylord Hall studio here at Game Day U. Tevis Hillis alongside Matt Bowling, Austin Hernandez, and Kimber Ball. We're taking a quick spin around the nation to give you all previews of the top matches matchup in college football. Now, guys, we have big games. We're here. Now to kick them off, we're a pick em segment in Death Valley with Clemson, Texas A&M. Kimper, what are you thinking? I really hope I'm wrong about my pick, but I'm taking Clemson. I, I don't really see A&M pulling out the upset today as much as I would love to see that. I just think the Clemson offense is going to be too much. I think Trevor Lawrence is going to have a big bounce back, uh, bounce back week. I think Travis Etienne could have another huge game, but I think Trevor Lawrence is really going to shine this week. I think a lot of people a lot of people down in A&M would probably say that they should have won last year. If the clock hadn't run out, they probably would have won that game. But... I just don't see it being close two years in a row. I, I really don't see a and pulling off the upside. I'm going with Clemson. There we go. Austin. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to roll with Clemson as well. 
another thing is it was at College Station last year. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, man, that's a hostile environment to play in. Also, Kelly Bryant was kind of leading this team at that time. Trevor Lawrence, he did get a little, little playing time in there, but he is the leader of this team now. He's shown that he can step up in the big moments, especially in the national championship. So I don't think there's anything that you can throw at his way to where he'll be stunned or nervous. So, I mean, I definitely think, especially after having that bad performance last game, he's going to want to come out. He's going to want to, you know, show, show the world, prove everybody wrong because everybody's already talking. Like, you know, he was a Heisman favorite. He didn't have a good... Heisman favorite first game. So I definitely think he's going to go out there and perform. He has a great group of guys around him. So it's, it's going it's, it's to be, a, it's gonna be a, good, uh, a good performance for him. So I got Clemson with the win. Um, it's going to be a good one. Yeah, I'm going to make it unanimous. I'm going with Clemson for a lot of the same reasons that you guys outlined. Offensive firepower plus home field advantage. But also consider the defense saw a lot of zone reads and quarterback runs against Georgia Tech. That should help prepare them for a quarterback with the scrambling ability of Kellen Mond. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, having the home field advantage is big. Um, you know, Travis Etienne, he's going to keep he's going to keep carrying the load. He's going to keep doing his thing. Trevor Lawrence is going to keep doing his thing. And I mean, I, they may even I, actually, you know what? I'm not I'm not going to say that. I don't think they're going to run the score on AM. I definitely think it's going to be a good game. I actually got it 30-17. But I mean, we're just it's going to be a good one. I just I can't see AM pulling up the upset in this one and not, just pulling it off. Not so. in Death Valley. I think that home field advantage is just too much. Consider, the, consider this. Texas A&M won just one true road game last year. Yeah, see? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just, I don't know. I, I just can't see it happening. Guys, now we go down to Austin for what may be the biggest matchup Absolutely. of the day. Joe Burrow and LSU visit the Longhorns in a pivotal early season matchup. Both programs won hardly in week one. And while the Tigers likely have a more talented team all around, Sam Ellinger and Texas will have a rowdy crowd in their favor. Kemper, in the end, who wins this big game? I think we are really lucky to have this matchup. This is essentially a college football playoff game because this can decide a college football playoff spot for one of these two teams. I don't think either of these teams went out, but I think Texas takes this game. I think Texas, while I don't think they're you know back per se, I think Texas plays well in big games. You know, Notre Dame a couple of years ago, us last year, unfortunately, and then Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. They perform well. They play up to their opponents. So I think a win in week two over LSU is exactly the kind of thing that could happen. And it'll just make it look better on our resume when we beat them in a few weeks in, uh, down in <laughs> Dallas. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna dis I mean, I got Texas winning, but I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I believe Texas is back. Um, they had a great season last year. They did lose to Oklahoma in the Big 12 championship, but they were able to beat them in the Red River game. They did go on to beat a good Georgia team in the Sugar Bowl. So I definitely think that boosts their confidence, knowing that they can keep up with the SEC defense. So Sam Ellinger, he's playing lights out. He only He's only gotten better. This Texas team has only gotten better. He has a great group of guys around him. I can And it's at home. It's in Austin, so it, I, I do think that Sam Ellinger, he's going to come in confident. He's going to pull this one off. He's going to have this team ready to go. Well, I'm not going to make it unanimous. I'm going <laughs> with the Tigers. Uh, I think Texas's run game will be very limited due to a strong defensive front from LSU, plus injuries to the Texas running backs. They're going to force Sam Ellinger to throw the ball against possibly the best secondary in college football. Meanwhile, on the other side, you have Joe Burrow, who's just – a straight baller so I'm expecting LSU to dominate both sides of the ball yeah it's gonna it's gonna be a good one I definitely think that both teams want to want to have this win because it's it boosts your season if Texas wins they're they're up there if, if LSU wins they keep their spot so I definitely think and having a win this early plays a key role when it comes down to playoff when it comes down to playoff discussion because a lot of teams they when the when the when the college football committee they look at the at the uh, team strength and schedule they're like well who, who are their big wins? So I definitely think that Texas or LSU is going to want to have this on their resume. And so for either team, you know, it's good. I definitely think that Texas is going to pull this off. They're going to, they're going to help the Big 12 out. And like you kind of said, um, it's going to make Oklahoma look good when we beat them in the Red River. Now, I so. think a blowout for either team would even help their resume even more. Oh, yeah, I definitely. think if it's a close game, maybe it'll help, but I think yeah. a blowout is going to help. Now, we referenced both of these teams earlier. Stanford and USC come limping into the contest without their starting quarterbacks in a matchup that could determine quite a bit in the Pac-12 race. The Cardinal and Trojans hope to get by with a second-string single caller. Stanford turns to Davis Mills, while Heenan Slavs gets the start for USC. Who do we think is in this one? I think I'm down going with Stanford to squeak out a victory. I think it's going to be a really close game in the battle of the backup quarterbacks. It, 
you know, I, I, I think the Stanford offense just is going to function more without their starting quarterback. I think it's, it's less of a loss than, the U- than USC losing theirs. I, I, I think Stanford's able to pull this one out. Yeah, I'm going to throw a little curveball. I'm going to go SC in this one. Like I said, I, I definitely think the fact that Stanford's losing their start, or lost their starting quarterback kind of makes things a little, little bit more even. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, uh, Keaton Slavis last, uh, last game, he kind of had a little – I know it wasn't much, but he kind of had that little bit of that in-game experience to where he can kind of get – get a feel for the offense out there. It's going to be a close one, like you said. Um, it could go either way. But, I mean, the game's in, uh, the game's in SC, so I could definitely see um, USC pulling this one off. Well, I'm expecting this game to look a lot like the Bears-Packers game on Thursday. <laughs> Ugly. <laughs> Defensive battle. You look at these two defenses going head-to-head. Which one's better? Stanford allowed just 210 yards of offense and forced four turnovers against Northwestern. Meanwhile, USC gave up 462 yards to a Fresno State offense that returned just two starters from last year. Yeah. Um, Here we go. Yeah, because, I mean, it's, like you said, I, I definitely think it's going to come down to the defense because, I mean, you got two new starting quarterbacks, quarterbacks running this offense. So, I mean, I definitely think they're going to have some difficulty getting, you know, started. out. If, if it is a shootout and they're just going back and forth, I'll be surprised. But, I mean, I agree with you there. I definitely think it's going to come down to the defense. If it's a shootout, I like Stanford for sure. If it's yeah. a defensive oh, yeah. battle, I can see SC pulling yeah. it out. But if it comes down to, you know, and as – Obvious, but who scores the most points? Yeah. If it's a high-scoring game, I think it's Stanford. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Qu- whatever quarterback can get a hold of their offense first. So. Absolutely. It's you, about a rhythm. You have to consider, too, Davis Mills, Stanford quarterback, is a junior. Meanwhile, Keaton Slovis is a true freshman. Huge. Yeah. I think experience is going to win out here. Huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Davis Mills, too, he was a, he was a, top, he was a top prospect coming yeah, in. Yeah, he so, was. I mean, he's, I'm sure he's ready to make this long way to debut. Blue chip recruit in the class exactly, of 17. Exactly, yeah. I'm sure he's yeah. going sure to – this is his moment to kind of – showcase what he's got and so I, I mean it's his chance to step up big so I mean it could go either way we had a huge game from a true freshman last week Bo Nix he was able to lead his exactly team exactly so yeah. I mean who knows you know, crazier Ke- things have happened yeah Keaton Slavis may come out there and just sling it I mean he has nothing to lose you know yeah there's no I Absolutely. mean there is pressure there but at the same time you know he knows that there's nothing to lose so I mean just take that with him and just go out there and do what you can sure. yeah so let's talk who are our upset picks of this week Ooh. mine's not a super exciting <laughs> upset. I've got Colorado beating Nebraska this week. I think Nebraska is a pretender. I don't think that they look like a team that should be in the top 25 or really anywhere near it. Adrian Martinez, their quarterback, looked terrible in week one. Zero touchdowns, 178 yards. Their leading rusher only had 44 yards, uh, and that was Dedrick Mills. Um, you know, I, I just don't see Nebraska being able to pull this one out. Another stat that I saw earlier, Scott Frost has never won on the road. At Nebraska. He started out the season 0-6 last year, still has zero true road game wins. So I, I don't think he gets his first one this week. I'm taking Colorado. Aww. Yeah, my upset's not very not very exciting as well. I'm going to go Maryland over Syracuse. Um, looking at both game one performances, I mean, Syracuse, they didn't look as hot, and they played Liberty. Uh, Tommy DeVito, quarterback, went 17-35, to 176 with two interceptions. Not the best performance. So, I mean, overall, Maryland, they did score that upset against Texas. Uh, Last year, so I mean, they could well they, the exactly, yeah. So I mean, they could have that that same energy when they come out there. So I'm going to go Maryland over this one, 34 uh, 20. I like that. It almost seems like deja vu. Army visiting a top 10 team in September and not being given much of a chance. They almost pulled off the upset last year in Norman. I think they do it today in Ann Arbor. Wolverines are allowing an average of 176 rushing yards over the last five games. How are they going to fare against a team that does? Pretty much nothing except run the ball. Inexperience in the secondary will also leave the Wolverines vulnerable, and this is going to be a historic day for the Army football program. Yeah, one. I mean, I know this is another. Uh, it's not a very big upset, but this is another thing I heard people talking about. It's Florida Atlantic over UCF. Um, I know I had UCF, like I said, making it in there, but I mean, what do you guys think? You think Florida Atlantic could I thought could pull the up? The game is at home for UCF, but I mean, do you think Florida Atlantic could go in there? And Florida Atlantic's defense looked horrible last week against Ohio State. I mean, uh, Justin Fields is fantastic, obviously, but some of those throws, I could have made some of those throws. There was no one around those receivers. Uh, I, I really, I don't see that happening. I love that Army pick, though. Yeah, I, 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 th- one, I really, yeah. I really think Army got a taste for, for the big game last year against us. I don't think they're letting another one slip through their fingers. I love that Army pick. Respect the troops. Respect the triple option. Exactly. Respect the troops. How, 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 Bad will that hurt though for the Big Ten, especially since a lot of people are saying, "Is it Michigan's <laughs> time to take over the Big Ten? That what if they? The what if, be, what if that prediction is true and Army actually goes out there 
and upsets Michigan, like how bad is that going to hurt Jim Harbaugh on this Michigan team? <laughs> That's like, going to be a bad look. I think you could maybe say that Jim Harbaugh could be on the hot seat <laughs> yeah. if, if they lose their that, if, that, if that happens, we won't have to wait until the Ohio State exactly. game to find out that the Wolverines are pretenders. And that's yeah. usually the game that we wait for. We're like, you know, Ohio State usually plays spoiler alert in that, and they usually come out with a win. So, I mean, who knows? If that pick comes true, man, that's that's going to be that's gonna be a, a, a big-time low blow for Michigan. One of fans. Michigan's biggest advantages is that they've got great home field advantage. So if they lose to a team like Army at home, I mean, that takes that out. That's I think you're going to see that that enthusiasm on that campus just drop. Yeah, I, That would be a really bad look for the Big Ten as a whole, and especially, obviously, Michigan, if they were to lose that game against Army. Yeah. Now, guys, we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to Game Day U here at Gaylord uh, Journalism School. Now, please admire this great live shot of the Palace on the Prairie getting ready for the, the, the big game tonight. So tune in. Yeah, South Dakota, here we go. Tune in next week for Game Day U.